and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that always gives its viewers what they want, which for some strange reason is more beaver, specifically disco beaver. Who am I to question it? Anyway, uh, since season two, maybe even late season one of this show, I've been wanting to take a deeper dive into the early years of cable TV as we now know it, uh, those years when it was in its formative stages during the 1970s, and I've never been able to pull it off, so kind of the early cable stuff I did way back in season one has just been kind of sitting ever since then for the most part. But I haven't been able to go through with this because there's just a lack of footage. And even now, nine, ten years later, there's still a certain lack of footage. But I think I've accrued enough to where I can at least try and put things in perspective to some degree. So with that, I'm sure you probably clicked on this video because it had such a funky title. Disco Beaver from Outer Space. And that's a real thing, and we will look at it. But uh, Disco Beaver was part of this whole trend in the 70s and 80s of cult comedy movies, which were all TV spoofs. And pretty recently, I was looking into doing an episode on those movies. But I wound up having to abandon the idea because of copyright problems. Uh, who'd have thunk that most of those things had been reissued? Uh, you wouldn't even think there was a market for them for the most part. But anyway, uh, I figured, well, there is one that I can kind of sort of get away with. And, you know, I've got enough early cable TV footage. And that one that I can get away with to a point is a spoof of early cable TV. And I happen to have, between my own collection and stuff on YouTube enough examples of what is being parodied in that show that, yeah, I think I can merge the two worlds. So, yeah, we're going to do a little TV spoof thing and some early cable TV-isms. And uh, when possible, I'll try and give you a uh, very uh, cherry-picked history lesson of sorts. Anyway, let's uh, take a little look at a certain rather infamous TV movie made for HBO, and how it's really emblematic of everything good and bad and right and wrong about early cable TV. What is the Beaver's mission? Why has he been brought here? We shall see. Given the relative obscurity of this one, I think some serious context is in order. Of course, the National Lampoon began as a satirical magazine, and quickly ascended to notoriety slash infamy. Then came the radio show, the albums, and the movies. Faber College, 1962. The brothers of Delta House have a problem. The dean wants them expelled. The I can only speculate, but I think it's a safe guess to say that the massive success of Animal House, released in July of 1978, gave American premium cable TV channel HBO the confidence to greenlight a TV movie from the Lampoon crew. I personally am of the opinion that the resulting TV movie was simultaneously a take-the-money-and-run middle finger toward HBO and a satire on early cable television, particularly Manhattan Cable which was both an original investor in HBO and happened to be within the coverage area of the National Lampoon offices. This TV movie was, of course, Disco Beaver from Outer Space, which premiered on the evening of Friday, February 23rd, 1979. Wild Affair. Play behind that Islander. No. The basic premise of Disco Beaver from Outer Space is that you, the viewer, are sitting silently watching TV, a cable of course, alongside a couple on some random night. A couple that does quite a bit of channel surfing. Each program, or in one case a teletext program guide, 
is a jab at the anything goes, and not to mention the what can we afford, nature of 70s cable TV. The program that the couple begins with, and continually returns to, is a mashup of a would-be Z-grade sci-fi flick and a would-be nature documentary called, well, you know. The beaver crashes to Earth in his wooden spaceship, because of course wood can withstand re-entry. The ship lands in New York City, the beaver goes looking for food, of course a difficult task for a beaver in a concrete jungle like New York City, and the beaver must learn to, uh, cope with his natural desires in this new landscape. And the beaver ultimately just magically starts eating his way into other shows on this cable system. Along the way, we're treated to a series of sketches, in some cases recurring sketches, which are mostly a bit more direct in their intended targets. Get ready for the biggest fun party ever. The premise of Disco Beaver is clearly rooted in the then ongoing trend of intentional cult comedies, both of the TV spoof variety, a la The Groove Tube, and of the Kentucky Fried Movie variety, as in a batch of comedy sketches strung together and just called a movie. Whether it was a budgetary thing, and or a lack of time thing, and or a lack of caring thing, Disco Beaver is hit and miss. While the parodies tend to be fairly accurate, just as often the parodies are too often underdeveloped and the humor is crude for the sake of crude. Worse yet, the parodies that do work were probably a little too esoteric for much of anyone outside of Manhattan. As mentioned, a good chunk of the parodies in Disco Beaver were of programming that was often exclusive to Manhattan Cable. Since Manhattan Cable operated a bit differently than most cable systems of the time, before we start delving into the parodies, let's give a rundown of how the system worked, as of 1978-79. Certainly from the mid-70s through early 80s, you had two banks of channels, channels 1 through 13, though channel 1 wasn't used yet, and channels A through N. All but one of the numbered channels were local and regional over-the-air stations. The sole proper cable channel was channel 10, MCTV, uh, Manhattan Cable TV which as best as I can gather was a mishmash of financial programming, old movies, and an electronic program guide. With one exception, namely the PBS station from Long Island, the lettered channels were where all the, if you will, cable channels lived, of course including HBO, which would incidentally, no joke, double your cable bill if you subscribed, and you needed a separate descrambler. Among the lettered channels were some stations that pretty much only existed to run local professional sports, some that subsisted on old, as in pre-1970 movies, and a few public access channels. The most specific target of the movie seems to be Manhattan Cable's public access channels, as seen in this parody of Manhattan Cable's electronic program guide. Now, we already covered the infamous Channel J on the second public access episode, but just briefly, here's the idea again. At the time, if a market was large enough, within the top 100 markets, the cable system was supposed to carry at least three public access channels, one for local government affairs, one for educational stuff, and one for general public use. Of course, New York City and all its boroughs ably met that criteria. As of 1970, Manhattan Cable already had two channels earmarked for general public use, 
specifically channels C and D. In early 1976, Manhattan Cable opened up a third channel for public use, Channel J, which was unique in that it was semi-commercial, some advertising was allowed, and that there was only one rule for the content itself, no hardcore pornography. Shock of shocks, a good percentage of the shows on especially early Channel J pushed the boundaries as far as they could. That's not to say there wasn't some milder content. Hell, one show was just two or three cameras set up at Boomer's Jazz Club on Bleecker Street, where you got to see, and of course hear, whatever artists and often semi-famous ones that just happened to be playing there. Unnamed force of an undying evil bent on the damnation of its doomed and unwitting pride. Mercy! I'm famished! The most notorious parody in Disco Beaver is called Dragula, which seems to be a hybrid parody of the B, if not Z grade movies that were run on cable at odd hours and of Channel J's penchant for sexually explicit programming. Dragula, as opposed to Dracula, is a homosexual vampire that turns his prey homosexual when he bites them. And that's basically the whole joke. Which, when its segments are added up, make up around 15 minutes of the movie. Which only runs 51 minutes to begin with. Funnily enough, Dragula seems to directly anticipate the bottom-of-the-barrel backwoods drive-in fare that ran on channels like Escapade during the 80s. And before you ask, no, this parody did not inspire that Rob Zombie song. Beaver. Split Beaver! <gasps> Let's get our show off to a normal start with our fabulous giveaway lady. She's the recipient of the Elizabeth Ray Giveaway Lady of the Year Award. Oh, shit. I beg your pardon. The lovely Miss Carrie Klein. Bring Carrie out. Yes, Carrie. You just gave it away. Here she is. Yay! Oh, fabulous. While there is a fairly brief game show parody in the movie, which I can only run about two seconds of, it does bring to mind some especially cheap attempts at game shows on Channel J. Like the Big Giveaway. About as big as The Big Giveaway ever got was tickets to, funnily enough, Boomers on Bleecker Street. But really, this show was all about giving its 100% call-in contestants grief, in the most stereotypically New York way possible. One more, one more wrong answer and one more bullet left. It's me or you. <laughs> Do you happen to know, sir, the name, uh, the name of the column? Who's there? Anybody? You're laughing. You're hung up. You're afraid of... Hello. Hello. Oh, I... I... Good. Sullivan Broadway. Sullivan Broadway is totally incorrect. This is it for you, kid. Face the wall. And they you. are killing Jews in France. The neo-Nazis. And we have pockets of Nazis and Ku Klux in America. Amateur talk shows were, and still are, a staple of public access TV in general. The noteworthy one in Disco Beaver doesn't seem to be a parody of any particular show, as it is a pastiche of shows in which the hosts invariably had no guests, took no viewer calls, and simply used their show as a chance to publicly air their neuroses. In this case, longtime National Lampoon regular Alice Platon, who also plays most of the female characters in the movie and wrote and performed the Disco Beaver theme song, appears periodically throughout the movie discussing her descent into addiction to Perrier. Uh, you know, the brand of mineral water slash borderline club soda. And before I knew it, I was like up to, uh, oh, about six glasses of Perrier, you know, bottles a day. And I would first thing I'd do in the morning would be like light a cigarette and have a Perrier, you know. Hey, what's the problem? Uh... The steaks are not well done enough. Just cook them a little more. Throw them back on their grill. Since there are moments of anti-humor in the movie, I guess this would be a good time to bring up a short-lived attempted alternative to the then-dominant Saturday Night Live. 
known as Manhattan Alive, which ran from 1977 to 78. Manhattan Alive is never parodied or even implied in the movie, but given the rather meandering and often limp sketches that populate that show, part of me wonders if it wasn't an unspoken influence on parts of the movie. You're not even a blood! I'm not even an Italian! Home box office takes no responsibility for the program you are about to see. The references to real persons or places or statements offensive to the sensibilities of our viewers have been made without the knowledge or authorizations of HBO. All complaints should be addressed directly to management of the National Lampoon. Late delivery of Disco Beaver from outer space are no time for pre-broadcast viewing by HBO. Constitutes a breach of contract. And absolves home box office of any liability whatsoever. Oh, yeah? As mentioned earlier, the movie does get in some jabs at HBO. Most notably, the movie takes a snipe at HBO's tendency at the time to label a between-movie break as an intermission. In Disco Beaver, the, in this case, properly used intermission, revolves around you watching a group of joggers taking an unsuccessful run around the streets of Manhattan, which ultimately gets completely upended by the Disco Beaver. This is derived from a then-common HBO intermission segment, which would involve taking a scenic mock jog or bike ride or whatever around Central Park, from the perspective of the participant. As of my making this, the Robert C. 2009 channel on YouTube has a lengthy 13-minute HBO intermission from 1978, featuring the Central Park footage and numerous other segments. I'd love to go to the sophomore bounce with you, but you carry your books funny, and I see you've got your watch on backwards. Given the constant parodies that TV commercials take in general, it's a little surprising that only two commercial parodies occur in Disco Beaver. The first, and far and away the most famous one, is a mock mail-order ad, if not a precursor to full-length infomercials, in which Alice Platon portrays, clutch cargo style, singer-turned-anti-gay activist Anita Bryant, who'd recently had a run-in with a gay activist, who awkwardly, appropriately, plugs her Homo Nomo Home Education Course. That's expert, Homo Nomo, 635 Madison Avenue, New York, New York, 10022. Either one. The other commercial is a bit of recycling on the Lampoon's part. On their 1977 album, That's Not Funny, That's Sick. Writer and occasional performer Tony Hendra delivers a public service announcement from the Terminal Flatulence Association imploring listeners to donate to Save the Whales before they blast themselves into extinction. In Disco Beaver, the Terminal Flatulence joke is reconfigured into a PSA that generically solicits contributions to find a cure for flatus. The audio version is way funnier. With your help, we can lick this killer illness. Terminal flatulence. Beginning. Good evening. My name is Roger de Swans. This one should be pretty obvious. This is a snipe at PBS's long-running Masterpiece Theater, the twist here being that the Lampoon took the opportunity to criticize the dumbing down of culture for the American masses, as opposed to outright eliminating it these days. The Lampoons recreate a typically low-budget early Masterpiece Theater episode and add-on text annotations, 
translating the dialogue of Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest to contemporary slang. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death? <laughs> Today's last early cable TV-ism is only referenced in one of the EPG segments. That would be the ever-dreaded cooking show. Now, of course, dating back to the first days of Archive, we've had cheap cooking shows pop up, but the only one of the public access ilk that I've ever been able to find, pre-1980, is a little something that aired over Warner Cable in Somerville, Massachusetts, called... TV dinners, aired in 1979. The actual cooking lessons are extremely minimal. It's really just a few tipsy home movies that somehow got submitted to public access. It makes my tonsils stand up and salute. Huh? Okay. Can handle it. If you've ever seen Disco Beaver from Outer Space prior to this episode, you're probably all too keenly aware that I skipped over quite a bit of it and merely glossed over other parts of it. Well, that's because, in case you didn't get all the hints, Disco Beaver is not family-friendly at all. Uh, if it were a proper movie with a rating and everything, it would be at least a hard R. So, uh, if you want to see it, how do you do it? Well, uh, it's never been on home video, and I don't foresee it ever finding its way to home video. Uh, I'd imagine at this point there's some pretty good rights issues between HBO and their current uber-corporate ownership and the current rights holders to the National Lampoon, and I seriously doubt either side sees it as a big enough deal to try and invest the time and money and stuff to renegotiate the rights. So, to see it, well, it's on the internet, several times over. You can find it uh, here on YouTube as of this episode at least twice over, uh, although it is age-restricted, so you might have to, like, start on an outside search engine and find your way back. You probably know the drill. But uh, it is out there, just, uh, yeah, it's not something you're going to want to see around anybody that's even slightly prudish. Anyway, that's going to be it for today's archive. Join me next time when I seriously overstate the cultural significance of My Mother the Car. Thank you, Mr. 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 Mr